So I would like to um, uh, welcome special uh, the group, Amadeus group from Spain. Who is from Spain? Very welcome. Uh, Italy. Okay, very welcome here. Uh, Israel. Yes, over there. Okay, welcome. And the group from the Netherlands. Very welcome. So we have four uh, Emilio Dose uh, groups uh, here, and we've, uh, Emilio Dose is also a special topic in our masterclass. Of course, we talk about myeloma, but Emilio Dose is absolutely a related uh, disease, and that's uh, one of the topics we discussed uh, within MPE, how to, um, how to cope with it, and what are the treatments, uh, what is the relation with myeloma. Well, you'll see when you follow our masterclass. Also, I would like to um, uh, remark that we have three potential new members, but I think they're very interested. Uh, Armenia, and I think they were present. Okay. Thank you for coming. And then we have uh, Sweden also, but the, uh, they already told us that they had other obligations, but they're very welcome. And also uh, a new group from Spain. I think they are not present at the moment. Maybe the next HM. Uh, we start um, today. Uh, we have two, uh, as a matter of fact, two subjects. Start with the um, first. Um, will um, uh, Alfonso and Ananda will uh, talk, uh, talk you through uh, the whole conference, the whole masterclass. Uh, today we start first with the MPE dialogues. That's more about myeloma and what how we look at it now, how we look at it at the future. And we, we ask a few uh, really experts to talk, us, um, talk about this and give us an update on this. And then we have our uh, prestigious Atlas project, which we are having for a few years already. And we want to update you on this. Um, Saturday will be more a, a long program, the whole day. Uh, and then we go more in depth on certain aspects around the treatments, the cures, uh, and the care of uh, myeloma patients. Um, uh, you can see it on your program. Uh, uh, the staff made this very practical, I think. Uh, maybe you, you've seen it. <clears throat> That's the whole program in one small slide. It's also very uh, handy when you have to speak. You don't have to, uh, ever have your papers, etc. So that will be our um, uh, program on Saturday. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoy our uh, masterclass today and tomorrow uh, very much. And I hope to see you also on Sunday morning at the ATM. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so welcome everyone, um, and and I mean to all of you that already know me, and uh, even more to those that you know come for the first time to the to the MPE community. Um, I hope you feel at home and you feel part of the family. Uh, my name is Ananda Plate. I'm CEO of Myeloma Patients Europe, and if you have any questions or need help, please let me know. So this session, the first session, will be around driving through the conference, and mainly what it, <clears throat> what it will tackle is um, key issues that you will find throughout the conference, and Alfonso will go into detail of the scientific expressions, the acronyms, and, and probably some of the, the concepts that you might not be uh, too familiar with. And I will give you an overview of the organization and what we've been doing over the last um, year. So the goals of the session, just to start off with, is um, to get to know a bit the organization if you don't already, uh, receive an update if, if you do know us and have been with us for, for several years, help you navigate the meeting, um, also help you set the goals that you have within your organization um, in terms of learning. 
So why did you come to the masterclass? Why is it useful for you? And also maybe refresh some of the um, myeloma and AL amyloidosis um, concepts um, that, that you have and that you will need throughout the conference. So um, just as a, as a summary of what, the, what MPE is and how, how it all started, so we merged in 2011 um, from <clears throat> the two pre-existing organizations that existed back then, which was Myeloma Euronet and the European Myeloma Platform. They both decided that it was not, um, uh, not fruitful to do um, the same things, duplicate efforts uh, separately, so they decided to merge and uh, the MPE family was created. So we've been going on <clears throat> since 2011. Here's one of the pictures, the very first pictures, um, where I can still, I, I can still see uh, Krista and Mika in there um, when, when this was created. Um, we've held so far several masterclasses. The first one was in 2012 in Edinburgh. And I mean, for those of you who have been with us since then, you know, things have evolved quite. I don't know whether Sapa is sitting in here, he's not. But you know, from the, oh, there he is. <laughs> you know, the first session really was um, homemade, let's put it that way. <laughs> And you know we were trying to identify people that could you know knew the topic and would you know stand in front of everyone and, um, and talk about it. It was a very you know a nice event, a nice get together, but it was not the same quality in terms of you know knowledge standards um, that we've reached now. So this has become more and more professional over the years. And, um, and, and this is the result of 2017. Hopefully this will keep on going this way. We have at the moment, um, I believe, 41 members, um, 38 full members, and we have three associate members. Um, this in, in 20, across 26 countries in Europe. And as you've heard from Hans, we have three new um, membership applications one uh, from Spain, one from Sweden, which we, we are very happy to, um, to have received because we don't have any member in Sweden yet, and Armenia uh, of the wider European um, uh, region. This is the um, governance structure of MPE, so we have a board which was elected in uh, October 2016. We have uh, five board members at the moment, and um, and for those of you who will stay uh, for the AGM uh, on Sunday, we will elect two more members, which we sadly lost. Um, one of them was Mika, and uh, and the other one was Mait, who resigned. Um, so so we will elect two members just to complete the the board picture again. Um, the board works very closely with the executive office, which you know, the board sets the strategy and the office um, carries out th those commands from an executive point of view. And, and those are my colleagues, um, Alfonso, uh, Ana Vallejo, Ana Rovira, and myself. And, uh, and pretty soon we'll be have Kate Morgan joining, who's <laughs> over there. Um, she, um, she applied for a job at MPE and she'll be joining on 1st of September, which we are very happy um, about. From a European perspective, and this is something you know, the, um, our industry colleagues that we met in the, in the morning might, might feel a bit bored for hearing this again. So um, there are several, um, there's no, there's no doubt about the fact that we work for myeloma and for myeloma patients. Uh, however, some of the activities that we do are cross-disease, and, and for that it is very important to align with other associations, other stakeholder groups, and even other uh, organizations, cancer organizations, or even patient uh, organizations in general, like it would be EPF or Eurodis, um, for example. Also, medical societies, in order to achieve wider, the wider picture. So we have, regarding medical societies, we're involved in the ESMO PAC, the ECHO, um, Rare Cancers Europe. 
We're involved in the European Medicines Agency um, Patient and Consumer Working Party. Um, we uh, also are part of a new initiative, uh, which is the EuroBloodNet, which is the uh, part of the European Reference Networks, uh, which we won't cover um, because of time limitation during this masterclass, but if you have any questions regarding that, please feel free to contact us. And uh, the we can, uh, informal we can um, uh, group of uh, cancer patient organizations where all the umbrella organizations of Europe are part of. These are our strategic objectives. They haven't changed over time. And basically, um, the key elements of this is to uh, create a strong organization, but also to facilitate the creation of sustainable and strong organizations at a national level. So what MP is really about is not only advocating at European level, you know, for access or for early diagnosis or, or, for, or whatever priorities we might have at a European level, but to also enable and build capacity and capability at a regional and national level so our member groups there are able to do the same thing at a national level. So really um, enforce and, and encourage them and give them the, the right um, instruments so they can move at, at a national level. And then we have um, several other strategic objectives, but I, I would focus on um, access to treatment, which is an issue in every region of the European Union and wider Europe, um, and early diagnosis. Those are the things that we can say are matter to all of the ones that are sitting in this room. So that's why I highlight them. We're currently developing the new, um, well, actually the board is developing the new strategic objectives and those will be presented to you when, when they're ready so you can give input um, and, uh, and will be voted at the next AGM. And um, from this, I think I gave the overview of MPE. I'll pass on to my colleague Alfonso who will drive you through the um, <laughs> dirty science bit. <laughs> Well, so thank you, Ananda, for, for the introduction. And well, as I'm based here in Madrid, I would like to give you a warm welcome to the city that I, I really love. I hope you, all of us, enjoy this, this uh, two exciting day masterclass. And, and also for those attending the General Assembly, we're sure, I'm sure we will enjoy in a different way on Sunday. <laughs> so welcome here. So um, what I would like to do in the next few minutes is just to give you a brief overview and to drive you through through the AGM. For those who have been attending here for many years, you may notice that there have been some slight changes in order to make this more interactive and more useful for all of you attending. And, um, and also for those who, of the newcomers, uh, I hope it will help you to understand better why we are here, what we're going to do. So, uh, first of all, when we are organizing this, this, uh, this, this masterclass, we, the, our main objective is that you make the most out of, 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 the, whole, um, uh, uh, of the whole meeting. And uh, we are here in order to, basically, you know that the, the landscape of myeloma has changed completely and is change, changing at an uh, incredibly high speed. And also, we are going last year for those of you who are attending the, the, the annual masterclass, we were talking for the first time about AL amyloidosis. This is something that some of, of you has asked to, to, to talk about. So one of the main objectives is to, to know about the science, to know about the latest and exciting updates in, in both fields, as well as in other related diseases. Of course, we have also thought about including some sanctions to, to cover one of our main goals, which is to help you build in capacity in your organization so you are able to advocate and to support better your patients in a daily basis. And this is something that we had in mind when developing this annual masterclass. Also, I think this is a great opportunity because we don't usually have the time to meet many times a year. So we have here two, two, three days to, to network, to share experiences, to talk to each other. We have in the room not only patient groups, but also some of very good speakers, physicians, and also from the advocacy community, as well as some uh, pharma representatives. So I think it's a great opportunity for you to engage with, with, with each other and so on. 
And of course, one other thing that I, that I, that I think is one of the most important keys of these of this AGM, which is to report back your community. Don't save what you're going to hear to, to hear today for yourself and try to share with, with, with the others. So as you, if you have the chance to go through the agenda, um, this year, uh, listening for, uh, for, for your feedback from other years, we have tried to, to make uh, an agenda which allows you to customize your your, your journey through the conference. So we have, we're going to start today, we have five, five panelists which are going to accompany us in our first multi-stakeholder panel and our first MPE dialogue, in which we are going to try to set the basis of what are the current state in myeloma and how does the future look like. And we will, we will have the, per, the perceptions and the opinions from different perspectives, not only from the physician side, but also including uh, the patient representative side, the industry, the regulator and the payer, and also to promote uh, the debate and the discussion. And you are very welcome to, to, uh, to participate in the discussion. Apart from that, we will have scientific sessions. Tomorrow we will start with a plenary session by Dr. Sonia Bergman to set up the basis of the current diagnosis uh, uh, and treatment guidelines in myeloma, ALA amyloidosis, and other health-related diseases. And then we will have, for the first time, four different breakout sessions. So you will be able to choose whether you want to go to one or to the other in order to, to cover your interest. Uh, one of them will be on AL amyloidosis. We will have Gianpaolo Merlini here, one of the most renowned uh, experts in the world in this field. Um, and the other one, uh, by Dr. Gabor Mikala, will be uh, about the role of a stem cell transplant in myeloma. After that, we will have again two uh, breakout sessions, one on clinical trials and drugs under development currently in myeloma and AL amyloidosis, and also a panel at the same time, a panel on how to treat myeloma in the light of access barriers. This is something that you have requested us many times. Many of you have told us it is great to know about the new drugs, but I certainly have some problems in my country with, with, in terms of access, so I really need to get this information. And also, uh, we will have some advocacy sessions. Two of them will be plenary, uh, one today about the Atlas to give you an update, also to hear back from you because we want this AGM to be very interactive. We really want and need to hear back from, from you. And the other one on a project that we started this year, which is the MPE Advocate Development Program. And uh, my colleagues, Anna and Anna, <laughs> out there ask you to choose some of the rotating sessions to mark three rotating sessions for tomorrow we, because we will be having a small groups working on different topics from cross-border healthcare, uh, the drug approval route, engaging with industry, and uh, best practices in supporting patients and caregivers. So I really hope that this year we, have, we are providing you a quality uh, agenda and the, uh, that really meets your, your expectations. And right now, even though I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> I don't have a scientific background, um, many of you are aware of that, but I would like to, you, 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 we are going to hear a lot of scientific terms here. We are going to have greatest speaker talking about very, very important and very interesting topics in both myeloma and amyloidosis. And to set the ground, I would just like to give a brief overview about myeloma and AL amyloidosis. So even though I guess, of course, you are very familiar with myeloma, I would just like to make a brief overview. So as you know, uh, myeloma is a type of, of, of blood cancer which is uh, arising for, from plasma cells. You know the plasma cells are they're responsible for, created, for creating antibodies, also called immunoglobulins, which are the kind of cells that help us to defend against uh, infections. And in the case of myeloma, these plasma cells start to grow uh, in, an, in an abnormal way without any kind of control. Uh, releasing only one type of, of antibody, which is known as paraprotein, which has no useful function. And then, if this continues growing, then you have what is called the CRAP criteria. You have heard about this. You are starting to have the common symptoms of myeloma, the hypercalcemia, the renal problems, the anemia, the bone pain, and so on. And in the last few years, we have witnessed something which is incredible, and I think in that sense, myeloma has been a winner. Uh, today, we have reached a level of understanding better how myeloma develops, how myeloma works, 
what are the genetics beyond the, the disease. So right now, the, uh, we have been able, and the, the, the researchers have been able to develop uh, different drugs with different mechanisms of, of actions. Even though we are still at a point in which, you know, myeloma, uh, you, you have, we have always said that it is a very complex disease. Even though we are knowing it better how it works, we cannot, if you think about some other blood cancers such as chronic myeloma leukemia, which tends to be more easy to manage and the, and the pathway is easy to, to, to handle, myeloma is still a complex disease. Uh, but certainly we are getting to a point in which we are knowing better about that. And also, if you think about what has happened, I wouldn't go too far away. In the last five years, three years, something like that, since the first, since the appearance of thalidomide and botesomid in the early 2000s, and now with the novel agents, uh, we are the armamentarium to fight against myeloma uh, has has great uh, has grown uh, greatly. Also, there is a better understanding of the early stages of myeloma. Also, uh, the, the, how the, the complete response is assessed has changed with minimal residual disease, which I will explain later. And also, uh, Sonia uh, Zbegman, Logan Garderet, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Gabo Mikala will, will explain tomorrow, has allowed us to, to really fight uh, the disease. So we had to pass a past scenario with the, you know, most of you have been in touch with myeloma patients or are myeloma patients by yourself, but like a decade ago, not, not so long, this was a devastating disease with a very acute journey, um, which really had a tremendous impact on the quality of life and the well-being of patients. Uh, while right now we are achieving higher survival rates, it is the, the management of side effects and also the, the symptoms of the disease is better, so we're able now to offer a better quality of life, a better well-being to, to, um, to, uh, to the patients. And also, it has been a great effort, and this is thanks to you in the community to empower patients, to provide patient education information. So right now, uh, we, have, we are winning little by little the, 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 the battle against myeloma. As I was saying, as uh, one of the main achievements during the last few years is that certainly a few years, about a decade ago or so, there were some drugs from the same family. There were no many ways to fight against myeloma. You have all the patients there. You try. You try to achieve a remission. Then if it relapses, you try again. But there were certainly not so many options. If you think about the new mechanisms of actions of drugs who have been approved in the myeloma portfolio, it is incredible because it's giving uh, a lot of weapons, a lot of combinations. And right now, the scientists are trying to understand how to treat myeloma in the best way possible, which patient might take more benefit for receiving a certain regime uh, of other. And here you have some examples. I'm not going to go deeper into details. Uh, because this is something that, uh, that will be uh, happening tomorrow in the master class, but certainly it's impressive what has happened in the last few years. Another important uh, thing that has happened, and, and we had the chance to discuss this this morning in an internal meeting we held, is the, the, the MRD uh, assessment. MRD stands for minimal residual disease, and uh, the thing is that in the in recently has been discovered using some very precise techniques, it has been made possible the fact of analyzing how many abnormal plasma cells are in the bone marrow. So um, what does this mean? Now we are able to locate a few thousand cells or, or to, to measure a few thousand or even a few hundred cells in the bone marrow. Uh, which has given us the possibility to know if the response that we have achieved with the treatment is good or how good it is. So here, this is a graph published in the, in the blood journal by, uh, by uh, Joaquin Martinez and, and his team, in which it shows how important MRD can be. So you can see in the blue line patients which has achieved the traditional complete remission, that is, we treat you with the with a certain set of drugs. Uh, you respond to the treatment, so we are not, we don't need to treat you anymore until you relapse. And that also happens in the red line. But 
as you can see, the blue line are patients in which the MRD uh, uh, measurement is negative. That means they are not able to locate many plasma cells, have normal plasma cells in the bone marrow. And the red line shows, the red graph shows uh, uh, patients in which there is a still a, a little disease, even the complete response has been achieved. And as you can see, the time to progression, it's incredibly uh, uh, much better in those uh, patients which has achieved the MRD negativity compared to the other ones. So this is something that it will, um, it will be discussed during this master class, and I think it has been one of the great achievements in myeloma. Here it is shown. I, I think I didn't quote here because I think this, this slide is from, from Jesus San Miguel, but I, I love it very much, and I think it really explains really really well what is the, the exact meaning of minimal residual disease. As you can see, the uh, myeloma and the symptoms is just the tip of the iceberg, but trying in our way to the cure, we're trying to have better drugs which allow us to have better and better responses and there are no abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow. And even though now, this is something, this slide for me shows something great that for the first time in many since since myeloma has been there, uh, physicians and clinicians are starting to talk about uh, are we now in the current way to cure myeloma and this is something great because it's a, for me it will be, it will be good to, to retire before 40 because myeloma is not, not a problem. Hopefully, who knows if that will happen but, but I like it very much. And also, I would like to put this slide. You probably cannot see the names on the list and that's a good news because this is the list of molecules that are currently under development, uh, under development in phase two and phase three trials in myeloma. I mean, for those of you who have been there 20 years ago, you know what was myeloma. There was basically a few chemotherapy drugs, nothing much more than that. If you think that some of, probably not all these drugs will get approved, probably these, not all the drugs will work. But this is amazing how this thing has changed. We have uh, still a lot of challenges out there, but really science is working and we are getting better and better in, in myeloma. Um, so now I will go on to AN amyloidosis, which I know this may be a little bit more unknown for, for some of you. Um, and as I said, we, we have started working on AN amyloidosis since last year. What I can tell you, I mean, this has been something from the board and also from the executive office. We are very passionate about doing things for AL amyloidosis patients because sadly, the things doesn't look as good as in myeloma. And we are, we are really trying to, 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 to do things for patients and try to help the patient community and hopefully work together with scientists, with industry, with everybody involved to really be witnessing what has happened with myeloma, hopefully will happen with, with AL amyloidosis. But let's start by by um, explaining what is amyloidosis. So amyloidosis is not just a single disease, it is a group of diseases in which one misfolded proteins, which are called amy amyloids, um, deposits and builds in organs causing damage. The problem is in, 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 in certain types of amyloidosis, it usually um, builds up in organs such as the heart or the liver and causing a damage to, the, to this organ can be potentially uh, fatal. And why we started working with the AL amyloidosis? Basically because, as Hans uh, stated before, between 10 and 15 percent of myeloma patients will develop AL amyloidosis at a certain point. So this is a real problem. One of the major issues has to be with diagnosis. Um, symptoms in, in amyloidosis, amyloidosis is not a very frequent disease. Indeed, indeed it, is a, it is a rare disease and the symptoms are quite vague. And there is not only just one single test to diagnose. So, uh, some the scientific communities and GPs and so on are not very aware of, of what is amyloidosis and that leads to a certain problem of infradiagnosis. And there are also, in, in contrast to what happened with myeloma, there are currently no approved treatments by the FDA or by the EMA for treating this disease. So how frequent it, it is this disease? Well, there was a, a set of records uh, done by the Mayo Clinic, one of the major uh, centers all over the world, in which where they were analyzing set of uh, series of patients that they have been treated since 1962, 2013. And as you can see, LA amyloidosis, 
or primary amyloidosis is the most common type of, of amyloidosis. There are also some other types, but this is, this represents, at least in this study, around 70% of, of the cases. And why, what is the link? And here you can see, if you remember, I was talking that myeloma, uh, the problem was with plasma cells were uh, starting to be produced in an uncontrolled way, started to grow without control. And when these plasma cells, abnormal plasma cells, uh, reproduce with that control, they start to free a certain kind of proteins called light chains with deposits that they can deposit directly on, 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 on certain organs, or they can accumulate in amyloid fibrils which tied to the organ. So um, uh, th this is basically the link between, between myeloma and amyloidosis and how how it works in very simple words. Of course, as I said, I, uh, tomorrow uh, Dr. Merlini will, will go deep into details about that. Um, and also this graphic shows a little bit the reality uh, uh, that we are facing today. This is also a graph from the Mayo Clinic, and as you can see, in this set of series of patients, you have four curves showing the overall survival for patients uh, since they are diagnosed. And you can see that even those patients diagnosed in the 70s or 60s has, uh, I mean, there is a, a better, um, um, a little better overall survival improved in five year terms. If you notice in the first year, the outcomes are very poor. And one of the main reasons may have been this for diagnosed, but there is still around from 40 to 60 percent of the patients passing away in, in, in six to 12 months within the diagnosis. So we really are here to, to try to do something. But there are also good news. And uh, last year, uh, for the first time, um, many of you might be uh, familiar with the um, uh, annual, uh, the, with the American Society of Hematology Congress for the first time in, in its long history, they had uh, a session on ALI amyloidosis, so it started to grow certain interest uh, on the community. And there has been some trials and some studies conducted with new drugs, which, which might be uh, potentially approved in the future for the treatment of this disease. So how has been treated, uh, in, in very few words, how has been treated uh, amyloidosis right now? Well, one, one option was to go through a stem cell transplant, but you know, some patients may not be eligible for, for this and traditionally has been treated with, with, with chemotherapy, basically with melphalan or cyclophosphamide. But um, there has been some trial and studies showing up activity of some drugs that you might be familiar with uh, in the field of myeloma, like uh, talidomide. Also, there was, it was showing some activity with some proteasome inhibitors. There was a study presented with, uh, about the usage of uh, bortezomib in combination with melphalan plus dexamethasone with, uh, uh, compared to melphalan and, de and dexamethasone alone, showing very promising results, mm -hmm. as well as, um, as uh, a study uh, called Turmaline uh, AL AL1, in which they were trying to, to show the, the effect of the use of exosomib in the treatment of, of uh, AL amyloidosis. Also, there has been some trials on, on daratumumab, uh, the, this monoclonal antibody, which is also used uh, for the treatment of certain types of certain patients with myeloma. And uh, the good news is that the, there is uh, the, and the other uh, monoclonal antibody, which has been, which has shown some uh, efficacy in reducing the amyloid deposits, which is called neo 001 There has been some promising results in two clinical trials in phase one and phase two. And now uh, they are going with the phase two, phase three trials. So hopefully um, in, the, in the upcoming years, we'll see uh, new drugs to treat these patients. And uh, well, that was basically everything for my side. We still have some time if you have any questions regarding uh, the, the conference. It's